realm of creepypasta, or short internet-based horror fiction, has become more and more mainstream as the years have gone by. Recently, the Sci-Fi Channel launched a new television series entitled Channel Zero. This series has broken new ground by directly adapting a popular creepypasta for the small screen. The first season, entitled Candle Cove, borrows from a much-loved classic creepypasta of the same name. I say borrows in quotation marks for reasons that will be clear by the end of this video. This show was made because, in the words of one of its creators, it's easier to get an adaptation approved for production than an original project. It always seems like, you know, not just in my career, but across the industry, in my experience, while, like, during the, the time that I've had a career, it just seems like adaptations are, are what gets made. Um, and for, for TV writers... Uh, who want to do original stuff or, or have creative ideas and want to bring their own stuff to the table, um, the challenge slash opportunity now is to find an adaptation that uh, you're excited about and then bring your own language and voice to it, right? Like, um... Let's get something out of the way right now. This is not an unbiased review. This is a highly biased review. I'm going to give you the background on this show and how its production affected me personally so that you can judge for yourself if my points are valid or if they're merely the butthurt ravings of a salty little bitch. In early 2015, I was contacted by Max Landis for the purpose of acquiring the rights to one of my better-known stories, Abandoned by Disney. I was told that this was going to be for a brand new sci-fi series titled, you guessed it, Channel Zero. Landis wanted Abandoned by Disney for the second season of the show, stating that he had already acquired the rights to Candle Cove for the first season. I was open to the idea, but I was interested in selling the television rights to my work rather than full ownership. This was never discussed, however, as Landis soon after stopped responding, presumably after losing interest. However, Landis did ask me to recommend good creepypastas to him for possible future seasons. One of the stories I recommended, No End House, turned out to be the story he would eventually adapt for a second season. Now, Max Landis claims that he was already in the process of buying No End House before I recommended it, but I found a tweet six months after our conversation where he was asking the internet at large if they knew who wrote the story. Uh, that doesn't seem like something you'd have to do if you were already negotiating ownership. Long story short, or as short as I can make it at this point, I told Landis I didn't appreciate being lied to, and I found it very unprofessional. He then took to Twitter to lie about the conversation, something he had been accused of in the past by others who claim he publicly smeared them when they had an issue with his behavior. He even mentioned that, hey, maybe one of my other stories could be season three, to which I replied, yeah, no, 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 thank you, nope, no. So yeah, this is not an unbiased video. It can't be with that history. Uh, I'm also not a fan of Candle Cove as a story, and I think Chris Straub is incredibly smug for someone who essentially plagiarized an Onion article, but that's much less of a possible influence. With that out of the way, let's talk about Channel Zero, Candle Cove. In the original story, a group of 30-somethings discuss a children's puppet show on a website called the Net Nostalgia Forum. The story itself was comprised of these posts, and while this was far from the first time internet discussion had been used as a story format, it did bring a realistic and believable angle to the story. These characters, known only by usernames and a shared habit of constantly asking each other if they remember things, eventually discovered that the show itself had never truly existed, and that they had been watching Static. One wonders why none of their parents, relatives, or friends mentioned that they were watching Static all the time, but this video isn't really about the story. The creators of Channel Zero took this basic premise and set about drawing it into a six-part television miniseries. This would seem to be a difficult task, taking a series of forum posts and converting them into an ongoing story in a visual medium. And it was. The show itself is stretched so thin that long, awkward pauses and meandering long shots of landscape appear to be played off as artistic choice rather than an obvious lack of anything interesting to present.
The story is not helped along by the incredibly low-key performances of the cast. Now, make no mistake, there was never a time where I thought anyone on screen was actually bad at their job. Not at all, I just feel that they have very little to work with. Again, the story seems so thin and awkward that I can't conceive of any acting choice that would have worked any better. It's a damned-if-you-do, damned-if-you-don't scenario. By the way, let's talk about just how awkward the final product actually is. Scenes just... end. There's no resolution, no pin at the end of a conversation, just sudden drops that jar you with a shift in footage more befitting a jump scare than a scene transition. Gosh, I wonder how this character will convince his children to stop killing people and come home with him. There must be some sort of powerful conversation or story-changing event that... Oh, he just he just walks out of the woods with them. Uh, that that's That's cool, too. Plus, just dream sequences. There are just so many dream sequences. Ugh. Of course, most, if not all, of this would be entirely forgivable if the story were compelling in some way. Instead, we're just treated to disjointed visuals that do not tie together in any sort of rewarding fashion. This tooth child? Why, he's the physical embodiment of a psychic boy who was murdered years ago. Why is he made of teeth? Well, well because the psychic boy made other kids pull out their teeth. Why did he, why did he do that? Well, uh, because the psychic boy had an extra tooth in his mouth. Uh, in my humble opinion, no explanation at all would have been better than that. Hey, who's that dressed as Jawbone? Why, it's this this lady the psychic boy helped once. But but what is Jawbone, really? Just some shit the psychic boy made up for no reason! No, really. The skin taker, Jawbone, is just random nonsense a child made up. No greater story, no outside influence, the villain is now completely born of and contained within the imagination of a single child. I don't think I have to go into every single plot thread, right? I mean, you get the point I'm trying to make here. Actual, intriguing questions are created, and then the answers are just... you know, whatever. But let's discuss Jawbone a bit more. In the original Candle Cove story, he's known as the Skin Taker, and is possibly one of the most iconic characters in the world of Creepypasta. He's on par with the Rake, or maybe Jeff the Killer, though I'd say he's nowhere near as well known as Slenderman, of course. So, what was up with Channel Zero's need to neuter and destroy the character? What was behind the name change, from Skin Taker to Jawbone? Funny you should ask. As it turns out, the developers thought Skin Taker was too scary for a children's show. Um, and we also changed the, the name of the puppet from Skin Taker to Jawbone because there was a lot of concern originally, both on my part and the, on the part of the, the network, um, that it would strain the bounds of plausibility um, that, you know, there, there would be a real children's show uh, with a character called Skin Taker. They actually thought that something was too scary for a fake children's show that didn't even exist in the actual universe of the story. I wish I could say I'm surprised by this, but I see it as part of a larger issue in mainstream horror. Have you ever wondered why most horror movies or television series go for jump scares and likable killers over things that actually horrify or disturb the viewer? Well people are a lot less likely to buy DVDs and merchandise if the film or show legitimately scarred them. A large section of the buying public will never want to see it again because they don't like actually being frightened. I feel as if this show fell into the same trap. The skin taker, I mean, jawbone, isn't scary. Nothing in this show is scary. It's just interesting to look at. So, be honest. You can sort of picture a Funko Pop Tooth Child figure right now, can't you? But let's stay on the topic of Jawbone. The character goes from a vaguely threatening puppet in the original story to a full-sized skin man in the television adaptation. He ambles around, walks through scenes, makes strange body movements, and generally does strange shit. But why? Why is Jawbone acting like some kind of grotesque performance artist? Oh, because the makers of the show hired a performance artist to basically do whatever he felt like doing as the character. A performance artist named Olivier de Sagazan, who is, uh, you know, 
outsider artist who just does his own thing. And, and I had seen his YouTube videos on, uh, when I was in the Hannibal writer's room and always wanted to work with him. And we just called him up and flew him in from France to do some stuff in, uh, in channel zero. You'll see him a lot more in the finale. Speaking personally, it just doesn't work. Having a character undulate around, pulling at its prosthetics, and moment chancing around the room like a mime on acid doesn't really say haunted children's puppet show to me. It just seems like one of the showrunners liked this performance artist's work and wanted to work with him on a project someday. Oh, yeah, right. Shoehorning this into the first series concerning creepypasta wasn't the best idea in my opinion. Uh, the good pastas are rarely, if ever, about skin-contorting wobble dancers who light themselves on fire and walk toward protagonists to show how edgy and cool they can be. Maybe I've just been reading the wrong stories, though. To me, this is kind of like watching every Jaws sequel, where the creators thought, Man, people sure loved the original film, and that's because the shark killed people. Let's have the shark kill more people and focus on nothing else that made the original great. But yes, I hear you screaming at your monitor right now. Slime Beast! This isn't about the original story. This is about the adaptation. You can't keep whining about how it doesn't stick to the original. Okay, okay, Jesus, relax. Let's get back to analyzing Channel Zero for what it is, a television series. Now, one might watch this series and notice parallels within the works of, say, Stephen King, for example. Personally, I think there's such an overwhelming King vibe that it takes me right out of any story they were hoping to get me invested in. Psychic children, bullies who get their comeuppance, mean dogs trained to sick balls. I can almost see the pitch right now. It's Stand By Me meets It meets The Shining meets The Dark Half meets Stephen King, May I Please Suck Your Toes, I'm a Good Little Doggy. The main protagonist, while largely anonymous in the original story, is now a writer who moves back home at the beginning of the show. If this sounds familiar, that's probably because you've seen every other fucking horror movie with the same exact setup. The show also attempts to mimic other acclaimed series like The Walking Dead and Game of Thrones. Through compelling characters and storylines? No, of course not. Through sudden and unexpected deaths! There are a couple of problems with relying on this tactic. First, you need to put in the work to make sure people care about the characters you're suddenly killing off. The only time they did this was when they seemingly killed the mother character, but then I immediately remembered that she had unfinished business in the story and literally could not die. Second, after you use one unexpected death, it then becomes expected. Oh look, a new character. I hope he doesn't die. Oh look, his only character trade is that he's sweet. I hope he doesn't die. Oh look, he slept with one of the main characters to show that she cares about him. I hope he doesn't die. Channel Zero goes from unpredictable deaths to entirely predictable deaths within an instant, and not even the death of the main protagonist holds any surprises by the time it's all said and done. What's more, the attention to detail is woefully lacking. Hey, look at the marks on Eddie's face. Hey, where'd those marks go? Hey, look at the scars on Mike's arm. Hey, where'd the scars go? A child has gone missing. Quick, everyone search the same exact place, despite the fact she could have gone in literally any direction. Hey, why is a television show appearing on smartphones and computers? Wait, let me guess the answer to that one. Is it for no reason? It, it's for no reason, right? Why is the main protagonist's daughter suddenly showing up with no explanation of how she got there? Why does she need to be central to the story when they already had a little girl who was being affected by the show? Why do they need two nearly identical little girls to both effectively be possessed? It couldn't possibly be filler to draw out the already strained series, could it? Could it? Why are there four children running around dressed as characters from the puppet show? Aren't there only three characters on the puppet show? What is this kid's deal? Why did the writers add a fourth child who's dressed totally normally with no mask to cover his face and hide his identity? It seems kind of random and haphazard, doesn't it? I mean, if I might go back to the original story for a moment, there were more than three characters on the Candle Cove show. But not only did the creators of Channel Zero get rid of one of the characters, they 
also threw in a fourth child just to stand around looking like he's the poor kid on Halloween. No, no, I have a costume. I'm, I'm dressed as a serial killer because they look like normal people. By the way, how awesome would it have been if they put any work whatsoever into the actual puppet show seen on Channel Zero? I mean, look at this shit. Look at this. <laughs> they employed a member of Jim Henson's studio for this. Jim Henson. Jim Muppet Fisting Henson. Also, is it just me, or did the show actually take a jab at fans of the story, representing them as creepy, stupid, basement-dwelling losers? You made this. It's fanfic. Speaking of the show within a show, at the end of the first episode, the main protagonist is told that Candle Cove never really existed, and he had been watching Static. Why doesn't he ever tell anyone else? The topic of the show comes up over and over again, but at no point does he tell his friends that the show didn't exist, nor does he tell them they were watching Static. Call me crazy, but that's something I would want to know. Ugh, I'm tired of talking about this now, so let's just skip the top hat full of other issues I didn't even touch upon and look at the missed opportunity. Not only is this a false step in the movement to bring creepypasta to mainstream audiences, but it's just a huge waste of time, talent, and funding. What if it turned out that the protagonist had been the evil twin all along, and the good one had been murdered? I mean, sure, it would be cliché as hell, but it would have at least ended the season on a solid twist. What if it had been revealed that the evil twin had been abused by the owner of the local water park, Skinners, causing him to create the psychic projection of the Skin Taker, who stripped children of their flesh instead of their bathing suits? I mean, sure, it's dark, but isn't that what you want in psychological horror? Uncomfortable darkness? I mean, hell, I would have even preferred that the evil twin won in the end versus the actual guardian ghost ending we received. It was a take-back of all the horror, leaving us with a heartwarming scene of a father angel watching over his child. Chris Straub once said that he didn't like Candle Cove fan works that made his story about child murder and serial killers. Child murders? Why did you have to go there? I was having a perfectly nice, supernatural, spooky time with your story. We were having a lot of fun together, and then you said that the episode was intercut with graphic images of kids having been killed. And I just felt like that was cheap. I felt like it was a safe thing to do. As far as something that's scary. <laughs> this is a common complaint of mine when I read people's additions to Candle Cove. Uh, then he said he loved it once he was paid by the makers of Channel Zero. That duplicity aside, I think that this show is a product of yet another group of creepypasta hangers-on who don't understand what they're looking at, but know that they can benefit from it. The creators of Channel Zero are in the same camp with the creepypasta narrators who only read the stories for subscribers and ad revenue, and spin-off authors who want to get attention not through good writing, but through creature name recognition. There are great narrators and great spin-off writers out there who do get what makes this genre great, and I hope that someday we'll see one of these greats in film and television adaptations. I don't know, man. Channel Zero was, like, a huge disappointment for me, and now I've thoroughly explained why. Uh, if you enjoyed it, that's cool. I'm glad you liked it. I mean, I don't even think it's caused irrevocable harm to Creepypasta or its transition into other media. It's just a missed opportunity. A forgettable mistake. A lost episode? <laughs>